Great. So our speaker tonight has influenced the way we raise our food from coast to coast. He provided the vision for Terra Firma Farms, and thank God he provided the how-to. And we're going to have our little exam tomorrow when he walks around the farm. And I hope that, if, that when he looks at what we've done, he can actually see some of his work in that, because if he can't, <laughs> it's still his fault. Okay. <laughs> we, stole, we stole shamelessly, shamelessly. Uh, but I always, everybody knows I talk about we stole shamelessly, so, so at least I admitted it. So it, it is a, an incredible pleasure. Uh, it's a significant moment in my life to be able to introduce to you an author of several really fun books. Uh, everything I've ever done is illegal. That was hysterical. Christ, like, we gotta read this one. It was great. Um, he's been in. He's um, a featured speaker in Food Inc. He was in the Omnivore's Dilemma as a featured farmer. He's um, authored books. He goes on lecture tours, and by accident, he, you know, whether it was divine intervention or not, he answered a phone call, which brought him here tonight. So without further ado, Joel Salatin. Thank you. That's that's very kind. I'll tell you what, this uh, you know a, a teacher who um, who sees a, a student you know, go on and be successful, like, you know, a chemistry teacher that sees somebody go on and, you know, in the world of chemistry or whatever. Uh, yeah, that, that's, that's the biggest thrill as a teacher. And um, so for me, uh, at, at, at now I've actually done a couple of these uh, where new farmers that have taken these ideas and run with them, um, I've come to encourage them, encourage constituents, that sort of thing, uh, but nothing gives me a greater thrill and, and pleasure. It's like the ultimate, uh, you know, compliment to be able to come and, uh, and talk to a new food community that is building around uh, a farm like us and to enjoy uh, another family's enthusiasm for that community uh, just it's just it's just great. So it's a real, real uh, pleasure to be here and to uh, visit with you this evening. People have always asked me, um, well, who, you know, where was your support community? Because see, our neighbors all think I'm a bioterrorist. <laughs> you know, our, our chickens are out here running and, and co-mingling with red-winged blackbirds and, and uh, wood ducks and uh, pileated woodpeckers and taking our diseases to the science-based Tyson chicken houses and threatening the planet's food supply. <laughs> so uh, I kid you not. I mean, they, they, really, uh, they really think that I'm a biker. So people ask, well, what was your support group, you know, in all those old years? And I'll say, my support group were my customers, not my neighbor farmers. They didn't have a clue, okay? Uh, but it was our customers who came and, and, and saw our and saw our children and would come up to them and, 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 and say, um, uh, you know, our family depends on you for our, for, for our health. And uh, what your mom and dad are doing is just, um, it, it's just amazing, and I hope you'll do it too. And, you know, and, and what that does to self-esteem, self-worth, um, <laughs> you know, that's powerful stuff. And, uh, you know, when the garden comes late, lady came and would pinch our little daughter, you know, Rachel, she was making pound cakes and zucchini bread. And, oh, my garden come ladies, last week thought that your pound cake was the best, you know, stuff in the world. I mean, you know, we don't have to go to counseling sessions to teach self <laughs> <laughs> And uh, so that's, so, so, so I, I really appreciate um, this community of support coming out and seeing this kind of support because, because it's a lonely road out there. You know, when Tara says, uh, I went out at, at, at 11 to, to check on the chicks, you know, and, 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 um, and a rainstorm comes and you're, you're running out to a flashlight <laughs> to make sure the, the new birds you just put out and they found the, you know, found the shelter. And, uh, and they're not all just sitting there hypothermiating, you know, in the, in the middle of a rainstorm. Uh, that's reality. 
It's a lonely road out there. And, and the other neighbors that are, you know, seeing how fast they can go broke and destroy the uh, ecology, um, they, they don't have a clue what's going on. And so, um, so you all, uh, when she says this is your farm, it, 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 it's more than just poetry. It's real. And so, um, especially until they make a big, you know, million dollar profit, um, it's your compliments, your encouragement, and your loyalty, and your, your go get them, girl. I'm going to go to bed. <laughs> it's, it's, it's your encouragement that makes this team go on. And so I honor and, and appreciate all of you all uh, showing your very um, uh, physical support uh, and emotional encouragement for uh, what this uh, new farm is trying to do. Uh, as I've been thinking, what what can I tell this? I mean, I've had I don't, how many of you come up and I heard you at Point Reyes uh, a couple of years ago when the when the lightning storm hit and the power went out and we were all in a room within the dark and I thought, man, these guys these guys are savvy, you know? They've been out to terra firma, they know what's going on. I mean, I don't need to tell them about you know pasture chickens and and moving cows around and all this stuff. This is a savvy group. So what can I what can I say that's that's um, that's that's really important and we'll, we'll take some I mean I could just stop and say what's on your mind and we could probably go till you know till we need to stop. But um, I thought I thought I'd, I'd mention a couple of things. These are new thoughts to me that are on my mind and if they're new for me then you know maybe they'll be new for you. Um, some are out of my new book, which will be coming out hopefully by mid-August. Uh, the new title of the new book is The Sheer Ecstasy of Being a Lunatic Farmer. <laughs> <laughs> Almost as good as everything I want to do is illegal. But, um, but The Sheer Ecstasy of Being a Lunatic Farmer, because you see, you see, um, uh, our our position, you got to understand, hey, it's great to see this turn out. It's wonderful. Uh, believe me, it's just, it, it's fantastic. But, but, in the dose of reality, a lot more people than this tonight are stopping at Burger King and McDonald's in Petaluma. I mean, we are still a tiny, tiny, I'm not sure we're even to the to the early adapters yet. If you study innovation and business innovation, there's three levels. There's the lunatic fringe, that's me. <laughs> then there's the early adopters, that's like from four to ten percent. And then and then once you get to ten percent, then it's like the hundredth monkey and the whole thing just that's the tipping point, everything tips over. Because ninety percent of people are followers, not innovators. Right. And that's kind of the you know the process. And so right now in this movement. I think we have finally, finally, maybe, maybe moved to about the three percent stage. You know, to the to the to the just just you know where we're actually getting a little bit of interest from or from people that are early adapters that aren't lunatics. We're just starting to, to move out of that uh, lunatic fringe. But we're still lunatics, right? We're yeah, we're still lunatic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so it's it, you know it's small. And um, and so I'd like to just share a, a, a few um, interesting thoughts because as we move out of this lunatic fringe, we're attracting attention. And Michelle Obama just put in an organic uh, garden. Uh, Teresa and I had dinner with Sam Katz, the White House chef, a couple of months ago. And, um, and he started explaining to us the pushback from the industrial community over that, over that organic uh, garden. Uh, letters. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, what do you people want to do? Uh, you you want to have the half the world starve? Uh, don't you get it? You want to bomb us back into the 1930s, into the Stone Age? You know, I mean, just from from the you know the the, the crop and the, the chemical the Monsanto cartel. Uh, and and these are these are very powerful powerful interests. And uh, I was I just had dinner last night with Michael Pollan, and he was telling me uh, that he is, he is now. Um, a lightning rod when he goes to like a land grant college. Now, you know, now, if you go to liberal arts and you speak to environmental sciences, hey, you know, we're, we're heroes, okay? <laughs> but, it, but if you go to a land grant school where they actually have an ag degree, and of course, you know, 90% of all the research is being funded by Monsanto, Sigma Geiger, Pioneer Seeds, Johnson & Johnson, Merck Pharmaceuticals, Tyson, uh, you know, whatever. Um, 
Then what happens is, as soon as they find out you're coming, you know, they call the president. We're going to withdraw funding for this, you know, five million dollar art center we just put in, or or not art center, but but uh, GMO GMO lab or whatever. <laughs> anyway, there's there's huge pushback, and he's he he's just felt it ramp ramp way up, and of course that's what happens. You know, Gandhi's uh, principles of of um, revolution are first. They ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. <laughs> <laughs> and so we've been ignored for a long time, okay, and now, and, and, and then, then they began laughing at us, that was about 15 years ago, now they're fighting. And if you think for a minute that we have won this fight, you better think again. Because there are some fascinating things going on, um, uh, not the least of which is uh, Obama's appointment of Michael Taylor as, uh, as food safety czar. Uh, Michael Taylor was a former attorney for Monsanto, <laughs> steered Monsanto's genetic modified organism program through, then uh, was named uh, by the Clintons to the uh, FDA, where he was the, um, he steered the uh, genetic modification organism, the GMO program forward through the FDA. And now he's just been named to, you know, the food safety czar. Um, that's the change. Uh, the, the point being that uh, there are, like one guy told me when Obama got elected, said, remember, there are 10 miles of USDA offices that haven't changed. Okay, so there's a lot of inertia here, and as we gain market share, every time you all now take your food dollars and spend them where there's a transparent, connected, heritage-based, indigenous carbon sequestration, I don't know how many more I can string together, but... <laughs> exceptionally tasting, nutritionally superior <laughs> food, you withdraw it, see, from the coffers of these lords of our paradigm castle who have been safely ensconced behind their, um, you know, offices in urban centers making decisions that affect the earthworms a thousand miles away. The ultimate outsourced decisions, the average farmer doesn't make the decisions that affect his, his or her own farm anymore. The decisions are made in corporate offices somewhere far away where the consequences of those decisions are never seen. And so what I would like to do is, is just articulate for you, and, and, and you, I'm sure, are meeting co-workers and family members and stuff, and some of them, oh, you know, yeah, you want to spin yourself down that organic food, you know, what, what's the point? It, you know, Burgers are burgers, cows are cows, chickens are chickens, and bread's bread, right? You know, we got this idea. Or, or oh, you people, you know, you're just a bunch of, bunch of uh, tilting at windmills. I mean, what do you, what, you think you can feed the world? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this kind of system can't feed the world. Or they say, um, oh, you, you've just joined that elitist group, you know, that, that pricey elitist group, and it, it doesn't really, it doesn't work in the real world. And so I want to give you a couple of things to the tidbits to, um, to encourage you as you talk about these issues to co-workers, family, naysayers, people, uh, and you feel that pushback so that you'll be, you'll have the art, you'll have the dope, okay? I want you to have the, 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 the dope. All right, a couple things. First of all, the feed the world thing. Everybody, anybody heard that? That's a big one, right? Yeah, everywhere I go. Two most common questions I get asked is, that's fine and dandy, but how do you feed the world? And number two, how do people afford it? All right. I want to deal with the feed the world thing, because that's, if you can't feed the world, then the price is not an issue, right? Um, okay. So here's the thing you have to understand. Most people don't realize that Sir Albert Howard, who wrote an agricultural testament and ran the uh, experiment station for the British Empire in India from about 19, 
15 to 1940, okay, he was knighted. Um, and this is before Gandhi. This is when you know India was still a British protectorate, okay. He ran the indoor uh, experiment station there, ran a lot of experiments, but he is, is pretty much attributed as the godfather of modern aerobic composting. All of the composting that we do today, from municipal composting to, to what we do on our farm is pig aerating, um, uh, letting the pigs, you know, turn the compost into pig aeration, I like aerobic dance. <laughs> okay. um, that, that is all uh, traceable right now to the 1820, uh, 1920s to 30s work that Sir Albert Howard dat, did in the Cecil plantations of India. And um, the point being, if you go to any, um, any living history farm in the U.S., Williamsburg, um, uh, Plymouth, <laughs> where the, you know, the Puritans landed, uh, in Virginia, we, well, Williamsburg is in Virginia, but we also have um, the Museum of Frontier Culture Museum, Frontier, <coughs> the Frontier Culture Museum in uh, Stanton, which where they brought a, a Scottish, a German, and now an African, and an English farmstead and rebuilt it, and they've got costume, you know, it's a living history costume interpreter, and and there's no compost pile any of these places. Say, well, where are the compost piles? Well, they compost pile. The word wasn't invented. I mean, in, in 1900, the word compost had not yet been invented. And so the, the, the thing we have to understand is that this whole biological, sustainable ag, you know, call it what you will, ecological food movement is about you know, as we know it, what we're reading about is, a, is literally no older than the chemical food movement. And so when the industry says we can't feed, you can't feed the world, they are not appreciating at all the advancements that our side has made. We have to understand that environmental degradation, major environmental degradation, from the Sahara of Northern Africa to the, um, to the Rajputan Desert in India to, the, um, to, to the, the eroded farmland of the Old South with the cotton and the tobacco plantations, all right, like on our farm where we lost you know, eight feet of topsoil in 200 years, um, all of that land degradation happened way before chemical agriculture. You can't blame that on Monsanto. You, know, you can't blame that on Seba I mean, you can't even blame, blame that on the U.S. Dove. <laughs> <laughs> that land degradation happened around the world long before chemicals, anhydrous ammonia, or petroleum or chemical fertilizer. And so, so what happened in the you know, 1900, 1910, 1920 was that there were people from different paradigms working on this problem. How do we maintain fertility? How do we feed the burgeoning population of the world now that we've you know, got vaccines to stop polio and now that we've learned about toilets? And that wasn't a word either, you know. Um, <laughs> Uh, there are a tremendous amount of words that we take for granted and, and pieces of infrastructure that, that have all happened kind of, you know, kind of in the same time period. The point being that if the same um, uh, interest and use of the biologically appreciative paradigm uh, had been used, that was used for the chemical uh, <laughs> approach, nobody would have gone hungry, nobody would have starved, 
we would have grown just as much food or more than we've grown today, and we wouldn't have had infertile frogs, three-legged salamanders, or half of the other maladies that the organophosphate DDT, the whole chemical approach, created and is now flatlining. In fact, this year, there will be fewer acres of GMO plants planted than last year, and the trend is down. <laughs> the trend is down because it's not giving a kick anymore. We have, we have exhausted the, the biological ability of that adaptation to give us a kick from this, you know, from this technology. And so when you think about all of the, the things that develop here simultaneously with the chemical or the industrial ag approach, you've got, you start off with composting in about 1920, and then, and then there's, of course, you know, um, mechanical, <coughs> mechanical seed placement. Much of the Green Revolution has nothing in the world to do with chemical agriculture. It has to do with, with better seed placement in planting machines, better uh, hay harvesting machines, cleaner raking of hay, uh, the point, the, 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 the logistical mechanics to actually more efficiently place or harvest crops. Much of the advance was that. With the old, you know, broadcast system, you know, it was hard to get a nice even soil layer and so, you know, you had, you had and you drug stuff over it, you know, and some would be, you know, this deep over the seed and it wouldn't germinate and others wouldn't be enough and the birds would eat it. Now we can precision plant it mechanically. That doesn't have anything to do with chemicals. That's just, that's just a, a mechanical, we've got a better technique. It's like, you know, a bread maker or a, you know, a, a crock pot. You know, we didn't have those in 1900 either. We talk about freeing up you know, kitchen time, <laughs> a slow cooker, I mean, now that's, that, that's a revolutionary, it's a washing machine, in my opinion. I mean, you throw supper in there in the morning, 40 watts of power all day, come home at four, supper served. I love it. <laughs> it's, it's, it's no, uh, I mean, that, that's as quick as it gets, all right? And so we have, you know, we have this wonderful um, uh, stuff. All right, so you got the compost piles. And then, and then you have the, the, the precision machinery. All right, another thing that happened <clears throat> is just an understanding of, of sanitation. Um, like one was deep bedded houses. You know, as soon as I get onto this stuff, there'll be some old, you know, PhD land grant professor back there sitting saying, yeah, I know, you're going to take us back to the hog cholera epidemics of 1930s and 40s. And all of us have seen pictures in the 1930s and 40s. Yeah, these outdoor pigs, they're in, they're in these lots, and, and, they're, uh, and, and it, it's a mess. And they had hog cholera epidemics. Chickens had Newcastle diseases. All right, what all of this was, was, in a, was, was the, the, um, the industrialization, the crowding up, the scaling up of outdoor type pro, uh, production models without the concomitant related infrastructure to metabolize the new upscale that was occurring. A century ago, farmers in our area um, would, would pull their hogs, put them up on the mountain and run them and they'd have their hog killing together, and they'd move from farm to farm and kill the four, five, six hogs. Well, what happened was, as the you know, population grew, the <coughs> urban sectors grew, and there was a bigger market, and, 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 and farmers began moving off of farms, moving into cities during the Industrial Revolution. What you had was this, this huge sudden uptick. I mean, you know, the Model T revolutionized the urban center. Um, you had, uh, you know, in 1910, all the metropolitan newspapers, the front page was screaming that, that our cities are going to implode under an avalanche of horse manure. <laughs> they really thought that it was, it was going to be the end of the world as we know it. <laughs> Five years later, Model T. Horse became obsolete. And the Model T actually 
um, exploded the whole factory industrial you know centers and depopulated the countryside and and this was all done before cities had electricity and sewage systems and so so it took about 20 years for the cities to get electrified and sewerified or whatever the word is um, to, to, to metabolize for the urban centers to metabolize this this huge uptick in urban expansion that occurred from about 1910 to 1930 during the heyday of the, of the automobile as the automobile replaced the horse uh, in, in America. And that's the way innovation is though. What happens is you, you, know, you, have, the, you have this kind of point of the spear of innovation and, and then you have all this, this related uh, uh, infrastructure, thinking, um, policy that, that, that kind of takes a while, like, like Slinky effect, it takes a while to, to catch up and, and metabolize the new ramifications of, the, of this, new, um, this, this new thing. And that's what it was here. And so, so you know, when there was no refrigeration and no electricity, the, um, the, the, the breweries, which didn't have refrigeration, had to be located right near these urban centers. It made a huge need to begin brewing uh, and have, have breweries right next to the cities. Well, breweries have a waste stream called distiller's grains. And of course, with dairy is very close related to you know milk and beer. They're kind of the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> and so the, the, the dairies, it was, it was a, a natural thing for the dairies to locate right next to the breweries. Well, the distiller's grains fed to, the, to these new cows uh, which you know were, were not clean because we didn't have mechanized front end loaders. Everything was mucked up, grabbed out, and and so so they were filthy, filthy places. Didn't have electricity, didn't have lights, didn't have fans. Didn't, you know what I'm saying? I mean, there was this there was this huge sudden uptick in concentration of brewery and animal without hygiene, without an understanding of hygiene, with no stainless steel. And steel hadn't been invented yet. Okay, and guess what? Feeding the cows all this distiller's grains in the muck, in the grime, uh, without proper hygiene understanding, we got underlying fever. We had brucellosis. We had all the things that the um, the food police today are paranoid about on raw milk. All right, but it was only about a 20-year period. Once the electricity came up, refrigerated trucks were developed, and proper understanding of hygiene, stainless steel was, was developed. And you had enough energy to spray down stuff with hot water instead of just cold water, okay, and lye soap. Once that happened, all of this, all these problems became obsolete. The, the problem is that it's very hard for us to appreciate this, this kind of ragged edge, you know what I'm saying, of, of innovation. We, we see it now in, in the, uh, the e-boom. You know, we, we've, got, we've got the cell phones and, and texting and, and schools. Schools, principals, and some of you I'm sure are teachers, and and the trying to keep up with all the new ways to cheat, communicate, uh, talk, <laughs> right? I mean, it, it, it's it's a it's a challenge because society, all of the infrastructure and all of the the, the parts, you know, the the uh, nobody's asking at the cell phone companies, you know, about the consequences of their innovation. They just keep innovating. See? And it's up to society to, you know, lumber along and, you know, hopefully come up eventually with, you know, with a, 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 with a metabolic um, ability to assimilate this innovation. So that's what happens. And so in this industrial versus um, uh, biological uh, uh, agricultural innovation time, you had composting, you had... Um, uh, precision machinery, and then we had uh, foliar feeding. You know where we where we did foliar uh, sticker sprays, where you you, you send um, chelated minerals to the stomata of leaves. We started knowing about what the stomata were when they opened, when they closed. Uh, electric fencing. That was a huge. I mean, it didn't even exist 
I, I mean, I remember in 19, early 1960s when we were trying to move cows around, we had to carry a piece of every cloth in our pocket all the time because the, the electric fence chargers were essentially glommed out uh, points and condensers from the old cars. And some of you remember, you're mechanical, you remember points and condensers in cars, okay? And, you know, that was where it would, it would run around the cam and, a, and that, that would uh, send the spark, okay, to those spark plugs. And, uh, and the points would get corroded. And so we'd have to carry a piece of emery cloth in our pocket all the time to go around to this, you know, thing and, and rub off the points so that you'd get spark. And, of course, that was after the cows got out and you realized, you know, there's no spark in the water because <laughs> the, this, this was being done. So, um... <coughs> So it was really not until not until uh, the early 1970s till we actually got solid state energizers, and literally not until you know the 19 early 1980s that we actually got really good dependable energizers out of New Zealand and Australia, where where the real uh, pinnacle of, of um, electric fence technology developed. That's only been in the last 25 years. Okay, but that that was the aha to allow us to do this mob stocking herbivorous solar conversion lignified carbon sequestration fertilization. <laughs> okay, and, and 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 even now this whole idea of moving rotational grazing onto the next level of what we call the mob stocking. Let me do it again. Yeah. 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 You don't think I can do it again, do you? Yeah. Mob stocking or vivorous solar conversion lignified carbon sequestration fertilization. Oh. Yeah. And, and if every if every farm and ranch in America would do that, in fewer than ten years we would sequester all the carbon that's been emitted since the beginning of the industrial age. Oh, wow. hmm. and that's wow. the truth. That's how easy it is. <laughs> What the mob's talking or the <laughs> What I just said. If everyone who had cows in North in North in, in the United States would practice that model, that's, that's where we intensify the herd. We'll put you know in a room this size, uh, we would put uh, 50 head for a day. I mean you know grass is up here, you can't walk through it. 24 hours later, a mouse has to carry lunch to get across. <laughs> right. What it's doing is it's biomimicry of the way the, the herds of buffalo, the big herds of buffalo, would you know, like a two million head herd being chased by fire or Indians or wolves or something, would have moved across uh, uh, periodically disturbing the landscape, chipping up all the carbon and, 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 uh, a lot, and freshening up the, uh, the plants to slough off their roots to pulse that organic matter into the soil because the plants want to maintain bilateral symmetry at the soil horizon. So if every farmer in America would do this, in fewer than 10 years, we would sequester all the carbon that's been emitted since the beginning of the industrial age. So why don't we? Why don't we? We don't we could make money. Because, does Obama know this? <laughs> oh, sure. Well, does he know this? I mean, what do these people know? I don't know. I mean, all they know, <laughs> they're so insulated. They really are. They're so insulated, it's unbelievable. Um, but one question. I've heard this argument before. But what do you base it on? Like, I, I can tell this to a million people, and they will, they will say, do you have the scientific basis for that? Where do I refer to? Did you learn how to say mob stocking your river solar conversion? <laughs> 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 yes, that's a giant. Alright, um, what it is, if you want to know the science behind it, you can go to the Holistic Management International HMI uh, website. Uh, they will give you the, the, um, the, the gigatons of actual carbon. Uh, what it is, is that the plants um, are pulling this carbon out of the air, putting it into biomass, into decomposable biomass. And, and um, because grass cycles so much faster than trees, Good controlled graze perennials um, actually cycle the carbon much more efficiently and faster than trees. No, I completely I agree okay. with you. The other site is Carbon Farmers of America. Uh, and that's where uh, those two sites are, are gleaning the science and actually doing the math. Uh, and it's pretty dramatic. I mean, I can tell you on our farm, in 50 years, we've gone from an average of 1.5% organic matter to 8% organic matter. All you have to do is if we took all of the um, grazed 
uh, land grazed and arable land in the United States and just increased it one percent organic matter that would be spread over all those acres that would be the number of gigatons of carbon that have been uh, put out since you know 1820 all right because of the marine carbon Yes, all the marine carbon, pro exactly, that's the exact same the kind of thing that we're, that we're talking about, yes. So, um, so here's the point that I'm making. When you, when you add up composting, stainless steel, refrigeration, um, foliar feeding, um, you know, chelated and mineral uh, placement therapy, um, deep bedding, chippers to, to be able to take biomass and use them as bedding uh, uh, aggressively, electric fence, all of this technology, I'm going to say on, on our side of the ledger, okay, if we had been fully leveraging that for these last 80 years, 70 years, okay, we would actually be growing way more food than we are today without any of the negative environmental consequences that we've suffered due to industrial chemical agriculture. And that's the truth. And so don't let somebody say, because I see it even among people of our stripe, you hear them say, well, you know, Man, I'm so glad that we at least had that for a while because if we hadn't had that chemical green revolution, half the world would be dead because we couldn't have fed them. Mm -hmm. Not true. Mm -hmm. Yes? I just have a quick question. Um, obviously, one set of argument is that people can move those cows in this room for one day and then but that is undisputable evidence. What's the argument that the other side has for not doing Oh, for not, what's the argument for not doing it? <laughs> So clear. Clear. Yeah. Um, well, you, know, you can ask the question, um, why do people not endorse the truth? <laughs> but, 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 it, 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 but nothing is undisputable. Because, because what's also undisputable is that I'd rather sit on the couch than go out and do something. Or I'd rather read, I'd rather read Monsanto's uh, uh, dribble. Uh, then, then, then read the truth, okay? And so, um, in other words, if you came and asked my neighbors um, why they don't do it, well, they would say it's too much work. You know, what, 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 when I say move cows to my neighbors, and I've got great neighbors, I'm not trying, but we just live on different planets. Um, <laughs> when I say move cows, when you say move cows, I mean they think. You know, three pickup trucks, two four-wheelers, two dogs, three cans of skull, snuff, a lot of spitting and cussing, and all day, and they probably still didn't get them all in. When I say move cows, it's, it's, it's you walk out there, and, and uh, I mean, it's almost like a game you play. They see you coming, they're waiting at the, at the gate, and, uh, and you open it up, and they, you got to get out there run over you. You know, because every day at 4 o'clock, they get a new salad bar. Uh, and, uh, and and so 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 it's paradigm. You know, it, it, it's paradigm, and, and paradigms are are amazing things because you see we have this saying, if I'll I'll believe it when I see it, that's wrong. You'll see it when you believe it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I like to ask. I like to ask. Sometimes I do sustainable ag things. I'll ask a group of farmers. How many of you ever argued somebody into organic farming? I've never had a hand go up. <laughs> you don't. You come here. You come here. And your heart is a filter for what your head will believe. See? And so, uh, so that's why I tend to not argue with people. You know, if, you're, if, if you think I'm a nut and nothing I say makes sense, that's fine. That's fine. You can go on out and eat fecal soup. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> And I, and I don't surround myself with naysayers. I don't get all set ulcers wondering, you know, why can't my neighbors see this? I mean, all of our customers come in. People come. I had a guy come. Uh, this is a true story. I mean, true as can be. Uh, I had a guy come from uh, Richmond, out, and he was a friend of a neighbor who, who um, they were having a Sunday afternoon potluck. 
we were in a drought. And uh, this guy had wanted to come by the farm and see it for a long time. And this gave him a good opportunity too. So he came early and came by and, and took a little tour. I took him around. He said, man, you're, you're green. You're the only green farm around. I said, oh, it's because we get more rain than everybody else. <laughs> he, he, he laughed. He said, oh, yeah, that's crazy. I said, I said, you don't believe me, do you? He said, no. He said, that's crazy. I said, when you go back to your potluck this afternoon, you ask the farmer there why we're green and he's not. He said, okay, I'll do that. So we, we finished our tour. He went over to the potluck. We came back two weeks later to, to buy some sausage or something. And he came in just, just, just hee-haw. He said, I got a funny story to tell you. He said, two weeks ago when I went to this potluck, I went to the farmer, uh, where it was, it was in their, in their you know, yard, went to the farmer and said, hey, I just you know, came over from Salatons, and you know, they, they're, they're green over there. Farmer looked him right in the eye and said, well, they get more rain than we We, how else can you explain, I mean, you can throw a bunch of evidence in front of somebody and they will tell you uh, naturopathy doesn't work. Chiropractors are quacks. Um, you know, I could go other, you know, uh, that you can. There, 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 there are a million, there are a million things. Um, in fact, you know, when, when people accuse us of promoting unsafe food, you know, like raw milk and compost grown tomatoes, that's unsafe food. You know, my response is, well, by whose science and whose authority is it, is it safe to feed your kids Mountain Dew, Twinkies, and Hobo cakes, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. but it's not safe to feed them? You know? right. yeah. Hey. All right, which brings me, which brings me, and I'll finish with this point, um, which brings me to, I want to introduce you to an unsung hero who is the paradigmatic leader of where we are today. Because all of us know about his counterpart named Louis Pasteur. Now, Louis Pasteur was a very famous man. And um, lived in France. And he um, did a lot of things, but the thing he's most known for is advancing the germ theory. The germ theory, which was, was real easy to present to people because it makes people victims. There's, there's bad guys out here. See, I'll look them at them. They're running around this microscope here. And, and there's bad guys there, and they're, they're coming out to get you. And, and, and we've got to kill them before they get us. <laughs> well, there was a contemporary of Louis Pasteur named Michel Beauchamp. And he said, au contraire. <laughs> he said, no. He said, yes, there are germs out there. But you know what allows them to get us is the terroir, the terrain. And he advanced the terrain theory. It's all about the immunological terrain. <coughs> well, Louis Pasteur was handsome, flamboyant, <laughs> and he really did great on Regis and Kathy Lee. And so the world loved it. All right? And we are still in our Western reductionist, compartmentalized, fragmented, systematized, individualized, disconnected, arts oriented, all about me kind of thinking. <laughs> we are still worshiping at the altar of the germ theory, Louis Pasteur. That's why we give H1N1 flu vaccines with mercury in them to our kids instead of ripping out the high fructose corn syrup vending machines out of our schools to build up their immune system. <laughs> and so this idea of germ theory, trust me, if you went down to the average soccer mom with a couple kids in tow on, you know, Friday afternoon down in the middle of town and said, man, do you know there's three trillion million, three trillion bacteria in your intestines right now? She's like, what? Cut me up and pour in the antibacterial. Get the pine saw. You know, get rid of these things. Each of us is inhabited with a three trillion member community inside of us that sloshes around and 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 
purees and cooks and has kindergarten, you know, whatever they do, I don't know. <laughs> we live in a bacterial bath. And annihilation of the bad bugs is impossible if that's our line of defense. Our line of defense is our immune system. Having a good army of good bugs. Okay? That's why, for example, in our brooder house with our chicks, we want the bedding to get like this deep so that we have enough, uh, 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 enough carbon nitrogen, which has to be about 25 or 30 to 1, uh, uh, a wide enough, deep enough mass to support a core community, like a compost pile, of real active nematodes and pathogen-fighting bugs. We don't want sterile. The only place you want sterile is in the surgery. Other than surgery, you don't want sterile. I mean, if it were sterile, we wouldn't make, make cheese. We couldn't make charcuterie. We couldn't, we couldn't eat half the food. We couldn't, we couldn't brew wine. We couldn't have sauerkraut. We... <laughs> Think of how many things we depend on bugs for, okay? But we've got this, this bug paranoia in our culture, and it all dates back to a love affair with Louis Pasteur. So, so I want you to remember the name. Say it with me, Michelle Beauchamp. Michelle Beauchamp. Okay, now, it's, 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 it, he's, not, it, it's, he's a man, he's not a woman, it's, it's the French Michael. Okay. So I just want to make sure we're on the same page here. But what's interesting is that when Louis Pasteur was on his deathbed, he was in and out and in and out of lucidity, all of a sudden he became very lucid for a moment, he was attended there by his, you know, um, um, inner sanctum attendants, and he raised himself with great effort up on an elbow, and they all you know, got around, and clearly he was getting ready to say something, and he said, Michelle Beauchamp was right. <laughs> it is all about the terrain. And he fell back and died. <laughs> it's one of the most famous recants in all of history. That's true. I'm not making that up. That's true. That's true. So you remember Beauchamp, because Beauchamp, his, his worldview, his paradigm, was the basis of every kind of, of alternative, you know, aromatherapy, iridology, chiropractic, naturopathy, homeopathy, everything that's, that, that's, that's quackery. Um, uh, Michelle Beauchamp, that, that's the paradigm. And that's what we're trying to create on our farm. That's what Terra Firma is creating on their farm, is to look at biomimicry, to look at terrain, to look at not how do we annihilate the germs, but how do we have enough diversity in a symbiotic, synergistic, choreographed dance to confuse the pathogens. <laughs> See? That's the goal. And, and, and so by your supporting that kind of thinking, you are... To your credit, you are bringing to our country uh, that kind of paradigm that says, you know what? This is related to the difference between being a victim and being responsible. See, if it's all about the bad guys out there, I'm not responsible because they're just out there to get me. But if it's about the immune terrain, then the question is, how can I build up my immunity? Can I build up my immunity quicker with Mountain Dew, Ho-Ho Cakes, and Twinkies? You know, Pop-Tarts for breakfast? Or can I build it up a lot quicker with Bratwurst Sausage and Eggs from Terra Firma Farm? <laughs> That's the question. And, and I guarantee you, I guarantee you that you can build it up a lot quicker with food that you can pronounce and food you can make in your kitchen and food that was available before 1900, you know, basically that should be our rule. If it wasn't available before 1900, we shouldn't eat it. Yeah. And I'm so glad hot dogs were introduced at the 1890 World's Fair. <laughs> okay, so Michel Beauchamp is the guy's name. Check him out. Um, but but uh, he, he should be on our lips. And, and to me, that, that understanding of terrain versus germ theory to me, 
I find a, tr I find a lot of receptive. I intuitively, it makes sense. And so desperately, what we need in our communities and our families and our movement is we need these little, these little sound bites, these little articulate, uh, logical, intuitive things. People don't stand still for science. They don't understand in any way. You know, their eyes glaze over. We need these kinds of little stories, these little, little kind of historical tidbits, these little sound bites to touch people. And as Stephen Covey says, touch people within our sphere of influence in our ripple of influence to bring them to this side of the equation so that we can extend our healing out these doors, out to Petaluma, out to California, out to our world. That's our ministry. All of us can be a part of it. Thank you for letting me visit with you. want to go. The time is uh, 9.05. I always like, you know, this time in the evening, you start seeing people, you know, what's good? How, how, you want to go 10 minutes? Yeah. 9.15? <laughs> 9.15. All right, 9.15, we'll, we'll quit. All right, 10 minutes. Uh, uh, questions, discussions, dissent. Uh, what's on your mind? Yes. I have a question. I really like how you talk about taking responsibility more and more families. Starting from birth and our choices about food, health, wellness, and even about our kids' education. I know you've talked or written in your books about your children and keeping mm -hmm. them and how to keep your children around, keep your family together, not just send them out the door and send them off into the world and just taking more responsibility with all of your family, including your education, and sure. how to keep them around. I would love to hear you talk more about that. Oh, well. <laughs> This is part of our compartmentalized thinking in our culture is that, that we, we need experts for everything. And, you know, I really think that it's a tragedy of our industrialized culture that we have expertized everything out of the household, out of the home. I mean, you can't fix your car. You can't grow your food. I mean, we've got people, lady stopped me, she was in Texas, and uh, she said she just got turned in by her homeowners association uh, for growing a tomato in her flower bed because that's farming and farming is prohibited. <laughs> <laughs> I kid you not. But, but we, we, have so, we have so compartmentalized our, our lives so that our, our wellness is up to that expert, our education is up to that expert, our, our recreation is up to that expert. You know, we don't, even, we don't even sit around and tell us if you want to be entertained. Nobody tells jokes and stories like a family anymore or brings out the fiddle. What do you do? You, you go to Blockbuster Video. This is our entertainment. Professional entertainers. We, we have basically taken uh, everything that used to be, um, that used to grow up within the home and, and be insourced. And we have essentially outsourced it to where our homes are just pit stops between everything that's important in life. As opposed to our homes being the important thing in life. Where we learn love and relationships, social skills and respect and honor and character. Um, you know, and, and, and we've, we've even done this to where um, a lady told me that when she was growing up in Washington State, you know Washington State's known for its apples, and so when they were growing up in the, in the 50s and, and uh, 60s, she said uh, during the summer, apple picking time, um, the, the school buses would come through the neighborhoods and uh, kids, anybody like over eight years old, could go out, get on a bus, and go out to an orchard and pick apples for, you know, five bucks or whatever for the day. And that was their spending money. Uh, and, that, and, that's, and if you, you know, and you didn't have to call, nobody called you, the bus just, you know, drove slowly. And if you wanted to go, you knew kind of the schedule and you got to get on a bus. Instead of going out and buying ice cream, you know, you go out and get on a bus. Well, you know, today, <laughs> liability insurance, you know, school bus used for non-school reasons, 
collusion between the school and local you know, child labor workers. laws. Child labor laws. I mean, so now the only thing that's legal for our kids to do is sit in front of an idiot box exercising their thumbs all day, and then we wonder why they don't learn character. Yeah. In fact, there's a huge physical reason. That's why I'm such a promoter of, of backyard gardening and things like that is because if you read uh, Gerald Diamond's uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel, you realize that the populations that came to be dominant in the world were ones that had close affinity with large livestock and did uh, um, and exercised their immune systems. And some of the big immune problems we're having now are due to the lack of splinters and calluses and dirt under the fingernails and actually eating dirt, uh, some, all right? Um, you can get all out of Jericho Park. Yeah. yeah, that's right, that's right. Um, and, 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 built, and exercising our immune system so they're properly functioning. And that, if there's no, for no other reason than that, we should be getting our kids out to do some gardening and scratching in the dirt and planting seeds. The other reason is spiritually to learn the miracle of regeneration and birth. Mm -hmm. Because when you're all you're doing is sitting in front of that, that uh, fantasy video game, if a guy dies, you wait three seconds, the machine gives you a new one. You know, if, if, a, if a building collapses, you wait three seconds, it gives you a new one. You know, if your hero dies in three seconds, it gives you a new one. Life ain't like that. When the tomato plant gets blight and dies, and you don't just resurrect it. And it's important for kids to learn that, that, that life is not all just controlled by me. I think if we're ever going to become a culture that exercises more humility instead of just hubris, we're going to have to get out in the dirt again and appreciate this miraculous mystical wonder of seed germination, planting, and growth to learn that it's not all about me. It's bigger than me. Yes? You mentioned earlier that um, you're the lunatic and then there's the early adopters and then... Yeah. <coughs> Is there a country or a society you can cite now that's doing this and is doing it well and is in this early adoption stage or about to tip is somewhere in the world that we can look at and, and learn from? Or is it still too... Not, not really. Uh, the, the one thing, no, the, 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 no country in the world, uh, but just um, there are pockets. There are pockets. In, in Europe or Africa or where? Well, uh, all over the world. China. Uh, Japan, uh, uh, goodness, uh, Vietnam. There are there are pockets. If you're familiar with uh, permaculture, um, there are there are certainly you know communities and groups. Um, but you know one of the interesting things uh, when I was at um, Terra Madre in uh, Turin, Italy, with Slow Food a couple of years ago, um, I went to all the the African delegations I could go to. And uh, what was interesting was the American delegation, the 500 of us that were there representing America, there were whatever, 5,000 delegates there from 130 countries. It was interesting that we spent all of our time trying to explain that we did not agree with American policy. <laughs> <laughs> and what was interesting was, at least I did, maybe somebody else did, but I didn't find a single other person there from any other country who also, who, who was in agreement with his government's policy. So all of us from every country of the world were lunatics. You know, we, we, were not, we were not accepted in the, you know, in the powers that be framework. And, um, and so, so we, we, have, we have communities, we have groups, we have areas that are, that are doing things. But uh, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty widespread, you know, uh, diffuse thing. Good question. Yes, ma'am. How are we going to get uh, healthy food in the schools? How are we going to get healthy food in the schools? Uh, that's a great question. Um, um, I, mean, I don't have all the answers, but let me just throw this on you for, for just for, to think about. We spent, some of you I'm sure know more about this, what was $728 billion for the AF, for the bailout, the AIG, and the, yeah. you know, all of the scalawags up there. Um, I mean, Bush started it, and then Obama just went on with it even worse. And um, we just spent that much on a bunch of scalawags. And for 
I'm trying to think now. I think it's five billion dollars. It's under ten. Let's say seven. For seven billion dollars, we could double the allotment on every single school lunch in America, and every single child could eat local artisanal heritage-based food for $7 billion. The, folks, the money's here. Yeah. And when people talk about elitist food, you know, and price of food, you know what? If you start going down, you've got money for what you want, and if we took all the stuff in the food system that's fluff and not really food anyway, you know, like Starbucks latte, <laughs> Coca-Cola, Doritos. Doritos, potato chips, McDonald's, Taco Bell, I mean, you know, tobacco. Uh, I just saw, I just saw, yeah, uh, Lunchables. <laughs> oh, my oh my goodness. Jello pudding. <laughs> TV dinners. Giorgiotto's frozen pizza. I mean, you can just keep going down the line. Are you with me? This stuff isn't food, folks. You know, sometimes I want to get up in the middle of Madison Square Garden, get a big AP system to be able to spit, say to the world, folks, this ain't normal. It's not normal to eat food that you can't pronounce. It's not normal to eat food that comes from 1,500 miles away. It's not normal to eat food you can't make in your kitchen. You ever try to make a high fructose corn syrup in your kitchen? My point is, my point is, my point is, there is enough money in the system. That's my point. There's enough money in the system. And, and we just don't, as a culture, we just don't have the resolve to, to decide this, this is important. This is what we're going to do. We just don't. Yes, ma'am. Well, I just kind of want to quickly piggyback off that. How can, I think this is a group of pretty like-minded people, and we're pretty blessed to live in this area. Sure. So how can this group of people change that resolve across the country? How can Petaluma affect Missouri? How can you affect Missouri? How can, yeah. How about how you're just affecting Petaluma, and let's start there. <laughs> but it's moving through here. That's what yeah. I mean. So there's, there, it's well, happening. It's growing. Absolutely. It's growing. It is. Where's and the, the, whole, the whole farm to lunch program is definitely moving. I mean, Chef Ann uh, Cooper is doing wonderful work, and, and it's happening, you know, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit of time. But the, the question was, how can we do this? And I'm just saying, we don't have to wait till tomorrow. I mean, I mean, it, you know, if suddenly there were this, you know, if every American woke up tomorrow morning with this epiphany, we should do this, all we'd have to do is pull $7 billion away from AIG, and, and we'd have it. I mean, that's how simple this is. So how do you get the government backing? So how do you get the government backing? Well, the problem is, that, that, that's, you know, the, the, the question then is, who is the government? Is the government really our elected officials, or are they just uh, marionettes on the end of Monsanto's string? You know, that's, that to me, that's the bigger question. Now, I'm not actually sure that the politicians run the country. The things that I've seen lately, every time I go testify at something, it looks to me like, like they're just basically being played like a guitar by Monsanto, Sibagaygi, and, and Archer Daniels Midland, and all the other rap of them. There's what? There's what? Uh, 50 corporations in the United States that have a larger budget than half of the world's countries? I mean, that's power. That's real power. Okay, one more question and we're going to... Over there. Yeah, yeah. Very fast. Is Monsanto's the top GMO whatever it's called, horrible, Yes. <laughs> okay. And um, I'm really confused because... So am I. There was... There was um, I was... My friend was telling me about this... Um, Test this Irish people did, and they, and, I, and they were saying that organic and non-organic were just the same. There wasn't any health difference. And I knew, of course, that was just dumb, stupid. Like, okay, so let's figure this out. So I said, okay, and of course this was complete, including pesticides and all the stuff. He's like, no. And I said, well, well what do you mean, no? He's like, well, of course they didn't include the pesticides and all the junk. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. And I just don't get why 
you're smart, many people are smart, but there are so many people that are so stupid. <laughs> <laughs> and businesses who who have an agenda. I mean, when Monsanto, for example, was justifying uh, GM, GMO potatoes for the FDA, they purposely used geriatric rats to do the test. When the same test was repeated in Scotland, same, same protocol, but on juvenile rats, then they had behavior problems, brain development problems, organ development problems, all sorts of problems. All right? And because geriatric rats already have fully developed brains, they already have fully developed kidneys, they already have, you know what I'm saying? And, and it, it's in that fast metabolic state that these things start, that's why the children show up the problems quicker than old geezers like me. And, um, you, know, you, know, you know you're getting old when the, when the only TV programs you ever enjoy watching are the ones that are supported by uh, Viagra Depends or Scooter Sport. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Anyway, um, the, the fact is that 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 when you want to see it, when you when you want to when when you want to see it, you'll see it. And when you, you know when you don't, you don't. Okay, it's 9:15. So now may all of your carrots grow long and straight. <laughs> may your chickens all lay double yokers. <laughs> may all of your cakes rise and not fall. <laughs> um, may you find your dream and be able to express your Janeness, Tomness, Timness, Anness, like we want our pigs to express their pigness. <laughs> and may your children rise up and call you blessed. And thank you so much for letting me visit with you. to do well by you and bring you the best real food and more education. And again, thanks to Joel for coming out and talking. What have you been doing this for? 24 hours straight now? And it's, always, it's always fabulous. So we'll see you. Remember, tours on Sunday. So. Yeah.